Hey friends, this is Allison Steele, and you're listening to Unravel with Allison, a show where I take a concept that's got me in knots, and we unravel it together. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. Today, I'm wound up about brainwashing. Let's unravel. So the internet says, brainwashing is the process of pressuring someone into adapting radically different beliefs by using systematic and often forcible means. But we're just going to break down the word, brainwashing. The brain is your control center, your primary processor, kind of the who of who you are. Washing is like the act of cleansing the necessary or like a ceremonial anointing. The brain is way more complex. So you experience your reality through your senses. Every single thing that you have ever experienced was by defining your senses. When sensory information is initialized, the sensation stems from a response to a specific receptor, which means that your nervous system filtered it first, processed it through the receptors, and brought it to your awareness. Your senses are your hard wiring, so your surroundings initiate senses for you to experience. So I used to tune out conversations on science, math, and physics because I didn't really have a good understanding. But when I compare stuff that I didn't think I understood with something that I did understand, I began to understand outside of my belief system, which is something I always encourage for people. I used to tell myself that I wasn't capable of learning so much, like innately there were concepts that were just beyond my grasp, too big for me to understand, something that I'll never be able to actually learn and experience. And since I couldn't understand them, I didn't bother exploring them, but I just recently changed that. <laughs> and now I genuinely like value the essence of a concept and try to understand it through this broad strokes reasoning. So take that into consideration as we're moving forward here. So these little neurons, your little nerve cells that your brain has billions of, relay the information to each other through like a complex electromagnetic process, chemical reactionary process, making connections that affect the way that you think, learn, move, and behave. So these like nerve cells, neurons are your little messengers. They travel through your nervous system and communicate with your brain. So the nerve endings absorb the impact of your surrounding reality. And then the signal travels through the nerve endings of the spinal cord, constantly communicating your experiences with your brain. The brain sorts out the meanings with each neuron like it continues an experience, but it ends with definition. So the neuron poses like the what's this and the two dimensional blank slate and your brain offers the third dimensional depth you're offered what's this, and then your brain says it's that, and here's what to do about it. The more often you experience life in similar ways, the more the brain expects it and understands it and ingrains it as true, real, and exact. How often do you question what is true, real, and exact? I do so often that I don't really care what's true, real, or exact because I think there are far too many variables and considerations for anything to be just one thing. Resonance is more important to me than the actual reasoning. It's like, it's like singing, so choosing to harmonize instead of matching pitch. So then to harmonize, it's like your brain has these two sides, the left and the right. And the left is said to be logical, analytical, objective, and masculine, while the right is intuitive and creative and subjective and feminine. So like the left is your structure and the right is your flow. And when you balance a concept between the two, you have more flexibility. So like a good example of this is the dad joke. Can February March? Nope, but April May. Or dad, I'm hungry. Hi, Hungry, I'm Dad is a valid statement, and it seems nonsensical, but honest, and it stuns the system when it's slipped into a conversation, and it's witty. I think it's hilarious when I'm on board and in tune with it, but I'm really confused when I'm not personally balanced. So like when I was a restaurant server having a rough day, my brain's all over the place, but I have a job to do. So I walk up to a table, and I go through my routine. I just have a little spiel to fall back on, and I am like just baseline running this process, writing down what they say, but I am not connecting with these people. So when they make a little pun or say something witty, I have a hard time keeping up with it. It's like, I don't get the joke at all because I wasn't ready for that. I just wanted to hear what you were ready to eat. I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't prepared to actually like see you as a person and communicate with you because my brain couldn't handle all that. I was focused on the left side of my brain that was ready for the structure and knew how to do the process, but the right side of flow was just like slapping on a smile in the meantime and not actually participating with the situation. So I did not flow with it and I did not get the jokes and I forgot their side of ranch. So like on this small scale, my system is shocked. And like I said, it's hilarious when I'm in tune, but it's really confusing when I'm out of balance. So I'll ask myself a lot, is this real life? or what is happening right now when I'm startled or my system is shocked or I feel stunned by whatever I'm looking at. Most of the time it's in conversation with others, but I'm really fascina fascinated by what other people care about. 
And I'm very curious when I'm told that something isn't real, mostly because everything is real on some level. Otherwise, it wouldn't even be in our field of awareness. So like dragons, souls, magic, unicorns, Santa, every single thing is real. Dragons are real because there's a AAA baseball team in my city that says otherwise. There's a whole freaking team of dragons. They're real. We're going to go ahead and just say dragons are real. Um, like at least once a week, I find myself driving behind a Kia soul. And I think it's hilarious every time that this is what we consider a soul now, kind of. <laughs> so if I have a defined concept of something, it is real if this concept exists. So if I can say the word, draw a picture of it, sing a song about it, relate it to anything, know how it acts, I know it. I know it's real without having experienced it. So like too many of us agree that dinosaurs are real having never experienced them. But if you ask me to squawk like a pterodactyl, I will produce a very specific sound that I have associated with that concept, having never actually heard a real pterodactyl squawk. But if we experience it or express it, it's real enough for me. So like I crochet and I was inspired by the spiral picture of like an older woman who is sitting next to like this ungodly large crocheted cat. Looked super cool. So I mentioned it to somebody who also crochets and she's just like, that's not real. And it's AI generated, but I'm startled because she's right. Still, I saw it and I didn't consider whether it was real or not when I saw it. But that's where we get stopped in our tracks. It's like the conversation's over because that picture was fake. But what I was doing was looking at the picture thinking I could probably make that. <laughs> it, like if I sat down long enough and cared enough and tried enough, like I could probably do it. And that's what I wanted to talk about. But we don't even like get the opportunity to um, with those little like those walls that we put up for ourselves when we're startled by our reality. Like we're too stunned to even continue on with the discussion. People used to say that a picture is worth a thousand words because you can conceptualize so much with visual exactness. And we're still valuing that notion a little bit here. So it's easy to initiate the experience of love for a grandparent when like this picture is all you have left of them. But if our images are being manipulated and passed off as true, then our conception of truth is being manipulated, therefore brainwashing us unless we are bright enough to see through it and bold enough to question it. But I personally don't perceive that threat, but I understand how like other people kind of get that. I was listening to a song recently, The Underdog by Spoon. It starts this dude just like looking around at everything like, holy crap, my future is coming so fast and I can't miss this call of a lifetime and looking around at everybody else like, what are y'all doing? You don't talk to the water boy. There's so much you can learn, but you don't want to know. You won't back up an inch ever. That's why you will not survive. Like the whole thing is just like rooting for the underdog because this is who we are. I don't know if that's the actual meaning of the song. That's what I gathered from it when I was in that mood listening to it. But like I feverishly agreed with that notion and that message of it that I startedly like started to heavily consider that first line. Picture yourself in the living room as a visualization tool, a genuine personalized tool. Picture yourself. This this picture yourself kind of picture is worth a thousand words. So growing up, I remember being taught the importance of walking in another's shoes, but I didn't really have great examples of what that looked like. Um, only a few people were pretty good at this and could talk through things with me from different perspectives. But most of the time, I'd see people making judgments from the results of another's actions. But like when I would walk in the shoes, I could understand poor behavior. And it shaped how I viewed everything in the world. <laughs> well, let me tell you, like I believed that every single person on the planet thinks that they are the good guy or wishes that they had the courage to be the good guy. And I stand by it. Mostly these folks are like mentally battling the bad guys. But even when I'm in the bad guy's shoes, I also see how he got there and how he was trying to be the good guy. But it's like this whole snake eating the tail thing. When it comes full circle, it's like a portal that doesn't like, I'm not worried about a snake anymore because it's bothering itself. I am over it and I'm out. I walk right through it. Like it's, it doesn't weigh on me. Whatever I think happened or, you know, whatever it was that forced me into their shoes, I'm out of them. I don't need to wear them anymore after I spend some time in them. But I don't think we really take the time to walk in another's shoes very often. We just make assumptions based on our perception of how we would handle it. So when I'm talking to somebody who's having a difficult time with another person, like I ask, have you thought about it from their perspective? And I'm like, maybe when they did this, they were feeling this. Or when they did that, they were feeling that. But far too often, I'm strikingly met with, I don't need to think about it that way. I would never be in that situation in the first place. Mm, I get it. Also, I felt it. Also, you still got to go. 
So when we were in school, we were taught like that the Native Americans believe that a photograph would steal your soul. Like in general, we were also taught that like Native Americans were just undereducated and haven't obtained the knowledge to be able to comprehend that it is just a snapshot and it's not really them. Like we were taught that it was like playing peekaboo. So the adults really there the whole time. It's not stealing your soul. You're still there. <laughs> like it was really um, presented to us in this way. It wasn't valued as like wise information to share just to kind of like bring awareness to the fact that, hey, some people are different and that's okay. And they can honor their traditions over there in their space. Funnily enough, like we're panicked now about how our data is so widely available and abused and how silly it is that we need identification cards to speak for us on behalf of the department that issued it. Like nobody believes anything anymore, but we insist upon this honest exchange. These pictures are no longer painting our reality. Like mugshots, that steals our authority right away. You don't get to write that story. Somebody is writing that for you, insisting upon it and putting it out there. Oh, if you've never seen your mugshot, if you've never had to have a mugshot, good for you because it is embarrassing. It's yucky. Like you feel like your image is at the mercy of others and you can be canceled at any moment if somebody exposed the real you. So we're protective of ourselves by blending in with others to the point where we stand in line questioning what we're waiting for, but we're too afraid to ask each other or God forbid even answer each other. It's like if we take a passive stance, we're seen as gullible, sheep, just absolutely brainwashed. But if we disagree or take action, we're seen as like menacing, punks, absolutely brainwashed. Like my soul has felt fulfilled by a photo when it was all I had left of someone. And I appreciate that image more than anything I can put into words. And my soul has been crushed by photos. Like after I had my kids, I would see these photos and I could not believe who I was looking at. I didn't even recognize this person that... This f photograph was like a picture was taken just moments ago and I turned it around and I just, who is that? I understand how a photo can steal a soul. After your breakup, when your heart sinks into your stomach the first time that you see your ex with their new partner, that steals your soul. Or like even worse, if somebody would like call out an imperfection in my photo, especially about like my body in any way. I would let them steal my soul right there and then. That crushed me too. When somebody compliments me, I don't even know how to respond to that either. It kind of just crushes me too because I'd rather talk about anything else. And I don't know how to gracefully just accept it and move on. But ultimately, when we're offered a new perspective, the results were change. Is this brainwashing? We talked about neurons, the nerve cells, how they travel, but I'm going to bring you... Um, bring you back to the early science to give you some background here. <laughs> so the early science believed that we were um, born with all of the neurons that we would ever have. So like children maybe would grow new neurons to like help build some pathways, but at some point we straight up stop growing them and they just like flow within our system. They just like move on and do their own thing. But in the 1960s, we observed the birth of neurons in the hippocampus, which is a part of your brain that's associated with learning and memory. These neurons that appear here traveled to other parts of the brain. In the 1970s, this discovery was confirmed, and in the 1980s, we discovered neural precursor cells, or I'm calling them newborn neurons. It's like a new blank slate to manipulate the structure of the brain. A study to understand how the birds sang reveal that birds showed an increase of newborn neurons during mating season. So it's believed that the newborn neurons can help retain new song patterns. They believe that these newborn neurons change your forebrain pathways. So the neurons travel like waves through the nervous system or uh, chemical signals that attract them to where they're supposed to go. And scientists think now that only one third of the neurons actually reach their destination, that some cells die in development or while traveling. Interesting that some cells die, but I've spent a lot of time imagining how these blank slates can be colored, like literally imagined it like a kid drawing a picture. Part of this was when I was listening to an audiobook, Three Waves of the Volunteers in the New Earth by Dolores Cannon. There were two chapters that I had to stop and replay a couple times because they caught my attention so strongly. I appreciated listening to an audiobook because I didn't have the words to sway what I was hearing. So hearing the audio compared to reading the words... I don't think I would have been able to grasp this same concept. I think it's like primarily an audio thing for me. So these books are like recorded sessions of like hypnosis sessions that are intended to access the subconscious. So Dolores does these regressions. She has a healing technique that she uses and taught. And this is what she was using as she's 
pulling information from the sessions for her books. She has a lot of content on ETs and UFOs, and this perspective is like reflected as she reiterates. So in the session, a person being hypnotized is instructed to like travel on a white cloud and be delivered to an important place or a specific time to revisit in the memory. So I've had actually one of these sessions done before, and I remember exactly how I visualized everything during the process, even though I was kind of like I was hypnotized, I was under, but I was still um, I was still watching this being painted in my brain. I went to a memory and it was like taking a flashlight of my line of vision. It was kind of, you close your eyes and everything is dark. And then as I'm starting to remember things, like I look at my toes and I see my toes. I look at my legs and I see my legs. Uh, It's the middle of summer and I'm in a swimsuit and I can tell it's the summer because my legs are hot and they're hot on the top from the sun and they're hot on the bottom from the seat. And I start remembering everything about how I felt that day. And it was just like, as soon as I started sensing it, it was just like being dropped right back into it. So that's kind of what I assumed these other folks were experiencing that I was hearing from these books and these sessions. But like I heard a story that wasn't a memory that someone couldn't actually physically experience. And I had to conceptualize this one on my own. So as I listened to them explain their surroundings, it sounded like a kid drawing a picture. You know, they were like, do you see your body? What does your body look like? Um, What are your surroundings? Where are you? And they were just, oh, look, there's a sun. Now there's two suns. Oh, this whole planet's perfect and everything is warm and everybody, like, it's just this light and airy feeling and it, it sounds like a kid drawing in a picture. Oh, look, now there's grass and now there's this and now there's that and everything is in perfect harmony. Oh, look, a butterfly. A fairy just flew by. <laughs> like, it sounds like a little kid drawing. It's a little kid drawing and the whole planet is perfect. And now it sounds from the perspective of the actual words that were written that they're talking about a planet, like a solar system planetary orb that is perceived as a memory. Uh, They move to like the next important date on this planet. They explain how like the planet was destroyed. And when asked what happened, they explain how they were off on a mission and they were doing work. And then it came back and others destroyed it while they were gone. And everything is just completely devastated. Everything's gone. And the emotion transferred in this message was so passionate. And the horror of the situation was like overwhelming in my heart. I knew I just, I was like, oh, I've felt that feeling before, (laughs) but I just heard it differently this time because the plan, it was destroyed. The planet was destroyed. The plan, it was destroyed. It's, it's the same feeling I feel when I have an idea of how I need something to go and it doesn't go my way and I'm devastated over it. I had to go to work and then I come back and this was done. This is what was left for me. Like that is the same exact feeling that I felt in my heart as I was listening to this, that the plan was destroyed. Things did not go the way they were supposed to and now it hurts. <laughs> They talk about traveling, like they're just moving through an airship sometimes. They just go wherever they think. There's no vehicle. And that's how your imagination and your mind works. You just think and you're there. And there's a lot of people during these sessions who go to like this vast knowledge library that has information about everything you could ever imagine. Boop, stop right there. (laughs) It only has everything you could ever imagine, which means it can only present up to the content that that brain you're conceptualizing with is willing to conceptualize up to. If they're presenting something that hasn't been experienced literally, it has to be made digestible. An airship is just like a particle floating through the air. So what if you could talk to a neuron, this quantum particle? What would you ask it? What would you tell it to do? How would you tell it to work? What would it tell you? How could it talk to you? I don't know. But I like to think that maybe that's what this is. Maybe each experience defines a neuron to be expressed. Maybe each experience creates a neurological imprint on the neuron. During my session, maybe I enlighten the neuron that captured the imprint of that specific memory. But these galactic experiences, maybe the potential energy initiated by the restful state and encouraged by an outside force not only develops these newborn neurons, but they match the energy of the generalized state and offer a snapshot of the present nature of the mind. So then when guided, the neuron becomes self-aware and assumes the depth of the inner brain mapping. Additionally, if the guide requests the support of the subconscious, they can heal your body. Like one of my favorite stories is somebody who was allergic to dogs. And when they visited this past life, they were in a constant state of terrier, terror. <laughs> I'm leaving that in. A terrier terror, one might say. Um, no, really under a constant threat of 
dog attacks, literally fighting for their lives in this past life of theirs. And the subconscious, which she abbreviates as SC, which I hear as I see, eyeballs looking. Um, anyway, the subconscious explains that the allergy was contracted because of this past life. So the SC is instru instructed to remove the blockage because it's no longer needed. But whether or not you believe it, enough people have been healed from these sessions to consider it um, worthwhile. I was listening to another Dolores Cannon book recently, The Convoluted Universe, book five, and I noted a pretty wild hiccup in a chapter that involved the idea of backdrop people. And the idea of backdrop people, are there like, that our reality is filled with these like soulless entities that are kind of uh, like in a video game, NPCs, non-playable characters, they're just floating around for us to interact with and for us to learn from, but they don't actually have souls, but they are just like somehow in our physical reality matrix, but not real people. They look dead inside. You don't some people think that it's obvious when you communicate with these people that they don't actually have a soul. They're like, oh, holy smokes, I think that was an NPC. I wasn't supposed to actually interact with them. They're here for decoration. <laughs> so these beings that are communicating through the body refer to themselves as people. And one of the people is explaining how they don't like coming to Earth because it's so dense and it's full of backdrop people. The backdrop people will fill the space that's expected of them. So like Dolores questions this, asking if this would, like, if she would be able to recognize a backdrop human when she spoke to one. She went to an example of like being at the airport. You can kind of just tell that some of those people are not really, really there. She didn't get an answer. The person that she was speaking to was confused and asked, uh, they just expressed confusion. So when she asked again, she changed her words. She rephrased it to what I recognized the my interaction with a backdrop peep with the backdrop people. So instead of putting it in the human shoes, um, she put it back to the people perspective, and that's when she got an answer. So instead of thinking of like this matrix type thing where there are filler people, NPCs walking around that don't really exist with souls, it's just like, I think that these are baby little souls, and it's referring to like the density of our matter, that every tiny little thing that makes up our reality sometimes like it could be a part of you, but sometimes it's stuck just being a chair or a paperclip. So like maybe these people that you're connecting with, these tiny micro neurons are like a pinhole sized people, but a tiny little observer. I also think it's worth considering that everything carries a vibration and resonance. So with this process, a relaxed body may be influenced by the energy provided by the guide. And if each action is expressed due to the neurological pathways, Maybe the energy expelled also carries these neurons as a quantum particle. So they're no longer observed in the body as they flow into thin air into another's field open to experience something else. So like the body is still processing an absurd amount of information, and we know this, but we assume the death of two-thirds of neurons, but maybe we just can't see them. Maybe... This is how we actually relate together is we are swapping these conceptual neurons within our field and we think like, oop, there's a newborn, but maybe it's not though. Maybe it's just pulled in from your exterior and enlightened in your field now. That being said, it's possible that the perspective delivered by the subject could be influenced by the expectation of the guide. So the guide's subconscious has like this underlying established enlightened particle which is expressed into the shared field. So the subject, a conduit, embodies the particle which is delivered to the hippocampus and already has an enlightened concept which attracts like resonance. So instead of an energetic snapshot, it's a conceptual snapshot in relation to the expectation, maybe. So I mentioned before that we were taught how Native Americans were respected but not valued. And we were taught something that we don't understand. And it's like insisting that something's true without having an experience tied to it. But the experience can't be created in your mind if you haven't established meaning. You're too tied to the concept. So like putting a flag on the brain and insisting you have ownership of this territory feels like a dog on a leash attached to the flagpole. It feels exact, but you can't do much else about it. <laughs> so I compared the example of a photograph like stealing your soul to be like peekaboo, object permanence. And like when we play this with babies, 
we think that they can't see us when we're covering our face. And that's why they laugh when we reappear. But maybe we are the only ones actually playing a game with these babies and we don't understand what they're learning or how the process works. Like if this is their first time experiencing someone waving their hands in front of their face or at them, like maybe they're just curious and wonder what's happening and they're like establishing what's happening. They don't think like, oh, where'd they go? Oh, there they are. They're just like, this is goofy. What are they doing? But the grown one is so excited about the baby's response that they're affecting the baby's energy field and the two are just enlightening the heck out of each other, cracking up. But it has nothing to do with the game that you're actually playing, but the energy you're sharing. Still, new parents, we are taught the five S's for soothing babies. You swaddle them, put them in a side position, you shush them, you swing them, or um, give them something to suck on. These are the five S suggestions to soothing a fussy baby. And when I had a newborn and I was so exhausted trying to do these things like gritting my teeth while the baby cried, trying to regain sanity and take care of this precious little monster. So I'm like giving this baby a pacifier, playing a sound machine, letting him swing in a chair, trying to like outsource these S's, initiating everything that I can with nothing paying off. But these are like primary soothing methods. That's why they're supposed to work. But what's funny is that when you pick up the baby and bounce it around and shush it and expect the baby to be soothed, the baby is typically soothed. So when I would outsource these S's or believe that like this is never going to end, it kind of held that truth until I did something else. When I could actually look at myself to remind myself to expect the baby to be soothed, I stopped sending that this is never going to end, started sending the energy of like, hey, I'm calm. You can come join me. We're just hanging out. And these children are just experiencing for the first few years, they're matching our resonance, our tone, and our energy. I think we should consider whether or not we have been brainwashed. Okay, so my favorite example of brainwashing was last year at, last year during the Super Bowl. If you watch the Super Bowl and you have a Roku system, <laughs> they got us. Okay, so watching the Super Bowl, there was a commercial that came on for the Roku and the commercial, it prompted a scramble. Like it made the sound like when Roku pauses asking if you're still watching, it does this little beep boop. And typically in those moments, you scramble for the remote. So you press still watching and it doesn't turn your show off. So the Roku commercial started off that way. And everybody in my space started to scramble for the remote. Then like we realized it was a commercial, but we now had the remote in our hands. About 10 minutes later, the Roku actually prompts you to continue watching. <laughs> But now you already have the remote in your hand because you just scrambled for it because of the commercial and you are ready to press continue watching. So I think this was like a collective, you know, depending on how you look at brainwashing, this was smart and systematic in that they program the commercial to show up before the system is automatically going to play it, assuming you've been playing it at least for like there's math that goes into this if you're watching at a certain time. So it's like, OK, if they've been watching since pregame, let's go ahead and put it in this quarter of the game. So that way it'll prompt it while they're still watching. They'll get the commercial, they'll get the remote. And then when it's prompted, they'll be able to use it. It's good planning. It's kind of brainwashing. I like to joke that I've brainwashed myself. I say it's a joke, but it's not. It's real. So I say that I brainwashed myself accidentally. Um, when I was growing up, I was mostly in good shape. And like I had spent some time a little bit overweight and spent some time a little bit underweight. But I was always like self-actualized. And most of the time, like I really loved my body. Like I didn't love my thighs all the time. Like I was a little sensitive about certain areas. But overall, like I was very comfortable with what I had and who I was in it. I honored it and adored it, decorated it, understood it. I could pick up a shirt, look at it and be like, yep, that'll fit. Then I had kids and I didn't feel like myself anymore. I hated my body and I was sad that it didn't look like it used to. And no amount of compliments or reassurance or anything, anything could change the feeling that was in my heart when I looked in the mirror at myself. I couldn't see myself at all in the mirror anymore. And I just wanted my body back. <laughs> I wanted to feel like myself again. And I decided to get it back and I felt no shame in that decision because I deserved to love my body. So I found the best doctor in the state and I talked to people who underwent surgery with her and they had rave reviews. I had a consultation. I put in a $500 deposit 
and I scheduled a breast lift and augmentation surgery. The surgery was scheduled a year in advance. I took out a loan to pay for it, and I regretted it when it became an emergency fund, especially when I was offered to move my appointment up. Since there was an opening like in the following week, and I should have been able to do it, but because of my financial situation, I couldn't. And even though like I knew I was going to build those funds back by the time my appointment was scheduled, I didn't question that at all. I knew I was going to be able to do that, but I was disappointed in myself for not setting myself up better on the front end to not put myself in that position to rely on that money. And then now I had the opportunity to get what I wanted even earlier. It was just like this catch 22, like, thanks for the offer, but I can't do it now, but I'll do it then. And I guess I'll just have to wait. And it was fine to wait because I was already anticipating waiting, but it also just like tugged at my heartstrings a little bit when I had the opportunity and I couldn't afford to take advantage of it. Still, every day I went back to the mirror and I looked at myself and told myself, you will love your body again soon. I considered canceling my appointment when we were coming up to it because I worked so hard to be able to afford it again. And I felt guilty about spending all this money on myself. I have a family. (laughs) I have kids. I have all this stuff. Two weeks before my appointment, I get an email requesting my bank information so they can refund my deposit since they had to cancel my appointment. If I canceled my appointment, I wouldn't have gotten that deposit back. I would have been out the $500 that I put in on the front end. Cool. (laughs) So my appointment's canceled and I get some money and I am just feeling better and starting to question whether or not I'm actually going to do this because now I have to reschedule and go through this again. I think, why didn't they reschedule me? Why didn't they reschedule me? They make money for this. Why didn't they reschedule me? I went to call them. I went to Google to get to their website to uh, grab a phone number so I could call and figure out why my appointment was canceled. But instead, that Google search brought me to news articles. She lost her license to practice. So those who suffered claimed that she was too focused on her social media presence, that their surgeries were mishandled. And I just hugged myself, decided flat out, I love my body. (laughs) I'm so sorry to ever put myself through that. I will never consider a risk like that. What a bullet that was just dodged. That could have been me. And for what? I loved my body. I just promised myself that I would soon. And okay, you got it. You get exactly what you asked for. I narrow-mindedly assumed that it could only be done in that one way, but my brain was streamlined to think that I could only get it done that one way. But another powerful perspective broke that dam and flooded my heart with exactly what I had anticipated. And I appreciated the clarity and my brain felt washed of that burden that I perceived that I had with myself and the barrier between myself and my body. Brainwashing is only bad when there's a victim. But is there a victim? I don't believe in the victim storyline. It's boring and painful, and there's too much restriction for the resiliency of the human experience to actually value this victim stuff. I appreciate the challenges. I understand situations I'd prefer not to be in, unfavored results of my actions. I see everything for what it is, but I'm going to take the responsibility for my authority. I can't always explain myself, but I know what I'm about, and I refuse to to release that authority or authorship to anyone but myself. I'm writing and constantly editing my own story. It's just better left in my hands. The victim mentality has frustrated me for years because we give other people the opportunity to hurt us far too often. And I used to do it all the time. All I've ever wanted is a seat at the table. And I was this little shapeshifter who could understand all these perspectives just enough to participate. But I never really felt like I fit in. And I didn't really mind that though because I was only hurt when I was bullied out of participation, or it wasn't a welcoming environment. I cried when I'd have to tap out, but I know my limits and I know that my fuse was short. And I was told stuff like, they're not laughing at you, they're laughing with you. But yeah, I'm sitting here not laughing at all because I don't think it's fun to compete. And I don't think it's funny when somebody associates a part of me with something that is hated and despised. I know they're silly jokes, but flat out too often, these were the only comments that I received. Notations of my behavior that were unfavorable. I don't want to play with you anymore. (laughs) Yet the isolation is absolute torture too. And I felt like I had no place to associate to be free because I'm a nuisance. And I really don't care if people think I'm a nuisance. I only care when it keeps me from participating. I saw it as my responsibility to protect myself. So I would leave those situations where I felt unwanted. And I was still able to participate if I wanted to, but I concerned others because I come off as sad and shy or weird, but I would just, I was just having my own back. 
I can't explain myself to you, but I promise like my barriers that I kept in those, those moments for a little while, they were important. I just knew I had my back and I knew what I was willing to live with and I knew what I was willing to participate with. And that just wasn't it. We perceive brainwashing when we view somebody as a victim. I'm just tired of treating people like they're victims. So I don't mean to say that the trauma that we actually endure doesn't render an impact. I'm not saying that we deserve anything that was done to us, with us, on behalf of us that we didn't ask for. I fully agree, actually, that nobody deserves that. And I know that I'm not invincible, but I also know that I've handled every single thing that's been in my life thus far, so I don't care. I just see resiliency, and I don't need to be a victim to bounce back. I can just be down and come back up. So the brainwashing systems, how does it work? The neurons, the senses, the reality, the nerves, what? <laughs> Let me paint you my picture with broad strokes. So we experience our reality through our senses, and the brain is constantly processing sensory information and directing the next behavior. Your brain's receiving all this information and then sorting it out into a conceptual pocket. In the pocket, it ends up, will initiate a response, also called your behavior. I see the, neuro, uh, the nervous system as like an energy transference, like the hard wiring of your body and the brain is like the sea of information. So the more that we experience and acknowledge and realize that we are sensing, we actually fuel this energy system. And each amp concept, whatever, becomes a drop of water in the stream, carries it along till it's deposited in like density. The densities create different weather patterns to be experienced in the body. So like one lake of density might manifest physically as like a muscle twitch. Another density might manifest as like muscle relief or relaxation. So when my sensory information is high, but the brain is telling me that life's too hard, I like ease up and then coach my body to relax. And this reduces the information to the brain and redirects it to the basic, easy human things. So like this looks like this. I have toes and they wiggle. That's when you wiggle your toes. I have knees and they bend. And that's when you bend your knees. So I just say all of these things about my body and then do them with my body. It's easy. But as I'm doing all of this, my body eases up because it remembers that stuff is easy. It's like this guided meditation helps, but like, then what? I just coast until like I lose it again and then need to like redo this basic easy stuff. It's an exhausting cycle. Honestly, it is, um, it's frustrating to keep up with when you keep getting met with so many of those feelings when you just feel like you're up against a wall. It's like you have to take a deep breath and back away slowly from the wall. Take the deep breath, look around, call it a wall and turn around. Make the process easier. Simplify all this communication with your body and your brain. So like a structured mindful approach, like a routine is encouraged to like help the brain remember this simplistic state quickly, to ease yourself quickly instead of pulling the plug to reduce the energy. It's like I realize that there's something else to do in the meantime. I don't have to tap out and walk away anymore, but if your mind is cloudy, it's okay to let the rain wash it away. Resonance is important. Like how the water drops will travel until they're deposited into the density, it's still a droplet and it's still part of the entire sea. And the brain's pathways are carved with everything we've ever decided is true or possible. A practical blank slate as a baby that naturally erodes through time. And the more we insist, the more permanent it becomes. So the primary stream where the energy is deposited and starts to flow through the charge of whatever you're willing to believe is true or possible, when you question if something is real, that's your opportunity to restructure the flow chart. That's your blank slate. Is this real? Go ahead and decorate it. You can open up the possibilities without insisting on the belief to satiate the space between the streams. So like you color in the gray matter, you decide what it is. It might feel like a headache for a moment, but it's just like a quick storm to integrate these new possibilities. And it's important to monitor what you actually tell yourself. Your I am statements, your any I statements are so important. I am, I can't, I won't. Your brain manifests the heck out of these I statements. They know that you're talking to yourself. Are you willing to welcome new possibilities? Ask yourself this every day and respond every day with I am. Ask yourself, are you willing to welcome new possibilities? I am. Every time you experience something, you have an opportunity to establish authority you decide what things mean. You create the meaning you experience. The meaning is a resonance. So any newborn neurons that exist that are born 
will capture the current representation that joins the current. While we're on currents, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about eddy maintenance. It's three things, a character, a person, and a process. So the character, I first heard eddy maintenance in the book, The Five People You Meet in Heaven. The book's told from Eddie's perspective, and he did maintenance work on a like peer carnival. So the kids called him Eddie Maintenance because his name tag provided his name, Eddie, and his profession, maintenance, but the kids think that that's his name. So in the book, Eddie dies, visits five people whose lives were affected by his life, and one seemingly meaningless act drastically changed another's life, and he met those lives and were kind of like shown how these little interactions end up meaning so much, even to people that you never legitimately interacted with. The person, Eddie Maintenance, we met in 2014. I was in college, and I was doing terribly in an accounting class. Just absolutely terribly. I've been a great student, and this is like the first class that ever put me to the point of, I will not get this. I cannot get this. I will not get this. And I tried so hard to get it. I'm studying in the library, and I feel like my brain's about to explode. I've got my paperwork all scattered out in front of me, and it's one of those stupid books that are basically a three-ring binder, and everything's everywhere. And I'm just trying to get my homework done. And this kid sits across from me. There are two chairs that are like, you know, relaxing, cozy, comfy chairs. And a table in between that has all my crap laid out on it. So there is no space for another. There's no space in my brain to speak to another human. This kid sits down and introduces himself as Eddie. He says like, hey, I'm your tutor. And I just can't. (laughs) I can't do it. I'm like, okay, who, who are you? Why are you here? I'm uncomfortable. Like I... I don't even want to deal with this conversation right now. The weight of this course is just like strangling me. But Eddie kept going. And he was like, no, I'm, I'm, here, to, I'm here to tutor you. This was, this was set up last week, right? No, it's not. Please. I, I just, I'm trying to do my homework, man. Really? Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> I didn't want to deal with any of this at all. But then Eddie's like, sorry, dude. I was just kidding. My friends put me up to coming over here, so I did. My name is Eddie. For real, though, yeah, we're just goofing off. And I appreciated that so much because I needed to goof off a little bit. We laughed and we bonded and we had a really good time and we exchanged phone numbers and he gave me a seat at the table. I was really happy to participate and it was the first time in such a long time that I felt like I had a friend. I was so focused on work and school at this time that I forgot that there's like a third thing that satiates me and that is being with other people, experiencing other people. And my partner at the time was at boot camp, so it was really frustrating to feel so alone in all of this, and it was really awesome to find a friend in all of this. And this is all because some dude named Eddie walked up to me for no reason, and he was my Eddie Maintenance. (laughs) But when I saved his phone number in my phone, I saved his name as Eddie Maintenance because of the character from the five people you meet in heaven, and it's still saved like that today. (laughs) Eddie maintenance is also a process. When I'm caught up in the concept, it's like a whirlpool of doom that I feel like I can't get out of. Or I realize that I can get out of it, but I don't see the value in it. Like, why bother feeling better if I always end up feeling like this again? It's like usually because I don't have an understanding of what's happening. I don't value what I'm doing. So I perform this Eddie maintenance and reduce the current. So like if I'm worked up about like a major family crisis and I start reducing the impact of that statement until we make it as simple as possible, I don't like what thoughts come into my mind when I'm talking about a major family crisis. These are garbage eddies and I don't want to play with them, but I can handle a crummy situation. And if I can reduce that major family crisis in my brain to a crummy situation, that can get swept away and it doesn't carry the weight of a major family crisis. But as I make these connections, I'm distracted enough and interested enough that my body kind of just eases up since I'm not resisting and avoiding this anymore. So I simplify it and I use language that includes sensory information because I'm clearly obsessed with the impact of that. Smells like dinner is almost ready. It feels like Easter outside. Oh, I'm having fun. Yeah, it looks like it. There's so many ways that you can put your sensory information into what you're actually doing. And the more you do that, the kind of easier it is to connect with your surroundings. But don't deal with those major big issues. If you can't feel what you're saying, simplify it. Sticky situations are tolerable. Crummy situations get swept away. Let things be sticky and crummy. They don't have to carry the weight of all this extra garbage. But you experience your reality through your senses. Your senses are experienced after the nervous system filters it. And we've restructured our filters. When you have done that, 
When you have changed your mind, you've washed your brain. I don't think brainwashing is terrible or it doesn't exist or whatever. I think it exists in this way. You changed your mind. I think it's perceived much, much differently. And I think this is pretty interesting too. So when we perceive brainwashing, I pulled up a list from the internet. Here's what I got. (laughs) Isolation from loved ones, strange rituals and practices, confusion and inability to think clearly, awareness and identity loss, decreased impulse control, disassociation, drastically different beliefs, financial manipulation, dependency on certain people or things, obsession, confusion, your devotion is rewarded, they are no longer themselves, their cult or religion will be their whole world. Another fun list I found are 10 signs that you have reached enlightenment. You're truly happy. Pain and pleasure no longer affect you and control your emotions. Traffic jams no longer bother you. You recognize that life is a gift and that your time here is limited. You're no longer afraid of losing your stuff. You take great delight in silence. Apologies and forgiveness come easily and you give it freely. You can go a day or two with no food without losing your mind. You become free from all that is controlling you and death no longer scares you. And how do you achieve this enlightenment? Focus breath work and meditation, body scanning meditation, mantra meditations, becoming aware of your awareness, staying present in the moment, self-inquiry, changing your mind about yourself, alleviates yourself, and sometimes it changes you so much that you are perceived as no longer yourself from the people who recognize you as a character instead of a person. When traffic jams don't bother you, that's a form of disassociation. When you have these routines that build the structure of your sanity, that looks like strange rituals and practices. When you do these things, you feel better. Your devotion gets rewarded. In some ways, people are changing their mind to feel different. I know that some people see this used as a manipulation tactic, but most of the time the people who are considered brainwashed or get pulled into stuff that they aren't supposed to be in are not, they don't have the compulsion. They have a curiosity. And there's this idea out here that curiosity kills the cat. But I got to tell you, curiosity is the only way out. If you're not curious about anything, nothing changes, and you just keep getting what you're getting. So for me, a fun example of this is, um, so when my senior year in high school ended, I quit my job because I was looking at a college and I requested off for it and it was approved. And then the day of, I still got scheduled to work, didn't know about it. And my boss was mad at me. And when I went in there to talk to her about it, she wasn't available. And when I asked the other manager who was there about it, he said that I'm going to have to take it up with her. And I said, he's more than welcome to because I'm just going to quit. I didn't feel like spending that time wondering if my job was in jeopardy and nobody was able to tell me anything. So I just quit. I wasn't putting myself through that. I was going off to college soon. I would figure something out. That week, I get a phone call that I have, that one of my friends put me down as a reference for this other job. So I could come in an interview for it. And it's like up to $17 an hour, which was a big deal at that time. Cause like minimum wage, I think was like seven bucks an hour. And it just sounded, you know, whatever, I'll check it out. I'll come in for it. And I got off the phone. And I went to my cousin's grad party and I got hammered and I woke up in the morning, like on the ground outside, brushed my shirt off and drove to that interview. And it was still kind of sketchy, but you know, I was hung over and whatever could be money. So I went (laughs) and I got hired and the training started the next day and I didn't even really know what I was going to do. But when I got there the next day, it was for Cutco knives, reaching out to your family and friends, selling Cutco knives, not something I'm super interested in, but I still stayed for a while. The fact that I went back for more than one day was really funny to my family, but on the first day, (laughs) the first day we got to watch the episode of How It's Made, which is one of my favorite programs. I love watching that stuff of how everything's made. And I've seen that episode of How It's Made on Cutco Knives before. So like, I wasn't really thrilled about the idea of this job or anything. And this was free training, but I didn't have anything better to do. Like, 
or free training. It was on paid training, but I didn't have anything better to do. And I was curious to see what was up next. And I would just went along with it to see what they're teaching people in here. But the story goes with the family is that like Allie was fooled. And I did reach out to a couple of people and I was curious about it. But after like three days, I was like, okay, I'm going to leave at lunch. <laughs> For me, brainwashing is a real and worthwhile self-care practice. It just means that I have found clarity. So for those who may view me as brainwashed or too expectant of my energy and insistent on a narrative that they claim on my behalf, a narrative they pity based on how they would view themselves in my circumstances, but they don't feel what I feel. Another's view says nothing about me, but everything about where their cutoff point is about where they see themselves. When people would assume victimization for themselves, they see me as a victim. Again, personally, I feel resilient. I value the malleability of my soul because I'm open to more opportunities and I'm driven to connect with others. This is the first time in my life I'm actually prioritizing and valuing that. So it's paying off at an exponential rate. I'm happy to report. Thanks for listening to another episode of Unravel with Allison. If you have any feedback, questions, want to chit chat or stay up to date on new releases, follow me on Instagram at Allison K. Steele. Let's keep in touch. Again, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next episode.